German idealism was a speculative philosophical movement that emerged in Germany in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. It was a reaction from Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason and was closely linked with both Romanticism and the revolutionary politics of the Enlightenment. The most notable thinkers in the movement were Johann Gottlieb Fichte, Friedrich Schelling and Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, while Friedrich Heinrich Jacobi, Gottlob Ernst Schulze, Karl Leonhard Reinhold and Friedrich Schleiermacher also made major contributions. Meaning of Idealism The word idealism has more than one meaning. The philosophical meaning of idealism here is that the properties we discover in objects depend on the way that those objects appear to us as perceiving subjects and not something they possess in themselves apart from our experience of them. The very notion of a thing in itself should be understood as an option of a set of functions for an operating mind such that we consider something that appears without respect to the specific manner in which it appears, correlating more to something like idealism than the common notion of idealism. The question of what properties a thing might have independently of the mind is thus unknowable and a moot point within the idealist tradition. Background Kant's work purported to bridge the two dominant philosophical schools in the 18th century. 1. Rationalism, which held that knowledge could be attained by reason alone a priori, and 2. Empiricism, which held that knowledge could be arrived at only through the senses a posteriori. Kant's solution was to propose that while we can know, via sensory experience, particular facts about the world, we cannot know the form they must take prior to any experience. That is, we cannot know what objects we will encounter, but we can know how we will encounter them. Kant called his mode of philosophizing critical philosophy, in that it was supposedly less concerned with setting out positive doctrine than with critiquing the limits to the theories we can set out. The conclusion he presented, as above, he called transcendental idealism. This distinguished it from classical idealism and subjective idealism such as George Berkeley's, which held that external objects have actual being or real existence only when they are perceived by an observer. Kant said that there are things in themselves, noumena, that is, things that exist other than being merely sensations and ideas in our minds. Kant held in the critique of pure reason that the world of appearances is empirically real and transcendentally ideal. The mind plays a central role in influencing the way that the world is experienced. We perceive phenomena through time, space and the categories of the understanding. It is this notion that was taken to heart by Kant's philosophical successes. At the other end of the movement, Arthur Schopenhauer is not normally classed as a German idealist. He considered himself to be a transcendental idealist. In his major work The World as Will and Representation, he discusses his indebtedness to Kant, and the work includes Schopenhauer's extensive analysis of the critique. The Young Hegelians, a number of philosophers who developed Hegel's work in various directions, were in some cases idealists. On the other hand, Karl Marx, who was numbered among them, had professed himself to be a materialist. Kant's transcendental idealism consisted of taking a point of view outside of and above oneself and understanding that the mind directly knows only phenomena or ideas. Whatever exists other than mental phenomena, or ideas that appear to the mind, is a thing in itself and cannot be directly and immediately known. Kant had criticized pure reason. He wanted to restrict reasoning, judging, and speaking only to objects of possible experience. The main German idealists, who had been theology students, reacted against Kant's stringent limits. Theorists Jacobi in 1787, Friedrich Heinrich Jacobi addressed, in his book on faith, or idealism and realism, Kant's concept of thing in itself, Jacobi agreed that the objective thing in itself cannot be directly known. However, he stated, it must be taken on faith. This faith or belief is a result of revelation or immediately known, but logically unproved truth. 
The real existence of a thing in itself is revealed or disclosed to the observing subject. In this way, the subject directly knows the ideal, subjective representations that appear in the mind, and strongly believes in the real, objective thing in itself that exists outside of the mind. By presenting the external world as an object of faith, Jacobi legitimized belief in its theological associations. b. Why reducing the external world to a matter of faith? He wanted merely to open a little door for faith in general. Reinhold Karl Leonhard Reinhold published two volumes of letters concerning the Kantian philosophy in 1790 and 1792. They provided a clear explication of Kant's thoughts, which were previously inaccessible due to Kant's use of complex or technical language. Reinhold also tried to prove Kant's assertion that humans and other animals can know only images that appear in their minds, never things in themselves. In order to establish his proof, Reinhold stated an axiom that could not possibly be doubted. From this axiom, all knowledge of consciousness could be deduced. His axiom was, Representation is distinguished in consciousness by the subject from the subject and object, and is referred to both, he thereby started, not from definitions, but, from a principle that referred to mental images or representations in a conscious mind. In this way, he analyzed knowledge into the knowing subject, or observer, the known object, and the image or representation in the subject's mind. In order to understand transcendental idealism, it is necessary to reflect deeply enough to distinguish experiences consisting of these three components, subject, subject's representation of object, and object. Schultz account noted that a mental idea or representation must be a representation of something, and deduced that it is of something external to the mind. He gave the name of ding and sick, or thing in itself, to that which is represented. However, Gottlob Ernst Schultz wrote, anonymously, that the law of cause and effect only applies to the phenomena within the mind, not between those phenomena and any things in themselves outside of the mind. That is, a thing in itself cannot be the cause of an idea or image of a thing in the mind. In this way, he discredited Kant's philosophy by using Kant's own reasoning to disprove the existence of a thing in itself. Victor after Schultzer had seriously criticized the notion of a thing in itself, Johann Gottlieb Victor produced a philosophy similar to Kant's, but without a thing in itself. Victor asserted that our representations, ideas, or mental images are merely the productions of our ego, or knowing subject. For him, there is no external thing in itself that produces the ideas. On the contrary, the knowing subject, or ego, is the cause of the external thing, object, or non-ego. Victor's style was a challenging exaggeration of Kant's already difficult writing. Also, Victor claimed that his truths were apparent to intellectual, non-perceptual, intuition. That is, the truth can be immediately seen by the use of reason. Schopenhauer, a student of Victor's, wrote of him, Victor who, because the thing in itself had just been discredited, at once prepared a system without anything in itself. Consequently, he rejected the assumption of anything that was not through and through merely our representation, and therefore let the knowing subject be all in all or at any rate produce everything from its own resources. For this purpose, he at once did away with the essential and most meritorious part of the Kantian doctrine, the distinction between a priori and a posteriori and thus that between the phenomenon and the thing in itself. For he declared everything to be a priori, naturally without any proofs for such a monstrous assertion. Instead of these, he gave sophisms and even crazy sham demonstrations whose absurdity was concealed under the mask of profundity and of the incomprehensibility, ostensibly arising therefrom. Moreover, he appealed boldly and openly to intellectual intuition, that is, really to inspiration. Schopenhauer, Perigur and Paralipomena, Volume I, 13 Schelling Schelling attempted to rescue theism from Kant's refutation of the proofs for God's existence. 
Now the philosophy of Schelling from the first admitted the possibility of a knowledge of God, although it likewise started from the philosophy of Kant, which denies such knowledge, with regard to the experience of objects. Friedrich Wilhelm Joseph Schelling claimed that the fictus I needs the not I, because there is no subject without object, and vice versa. So the ideas or mental images in the mind are identical to the extended objects which are external to the mind. According to Schelling's absolute identity or indifferentism, there is no difference between the subjective and the objective, that is, the ideal and the real. In 1851, Arthur Schopenhauer criticized Schelling's absolute identity of the subjective and the objective, or of the ideal and the real. E. Verything that rare minds like Locke and Kant had separated after an incredible amount of reflection and judgment, was to be again poured into the path of that absolute identity. For the teaching of those two thinkers, Locke and Kant, may be very appropriately described as the doctrine of the absolute diversity of the ideal, and the real, or of the subjective and the objective. Schleiermacher Friedrich Schleiermacher was a theologian who asserted that the ideal and the real are united, in God. He understood the ideal as the subjective mental activities of thought, intellect, and reason. The real was, for him, the objective area of nature and physical being. Schleiermacher declared that the unity of the ideal and the real is manifested in God. The two divisions do not have a productive or causal effect on each other. Rather, they are both equally existent in the absolute transcendental entity which is God. Maimon Salomon Maimon influenced German idealism by criticizing Kant's dichotomies claiming that Kant did not explain how opposites such as sensibility and understanding could relate to each other. Maimon claimed that the dualism between these faculties was analogous to the old Cartesian dualism between the mind and body, and that all the problems of the older dualism should hold mutatus mutandis for the new one. Such was the heterogeneity between understanding and sensibility, Maimon further argued that there could be no criterion to determine how the concepts of the understanding apply to the intuitions of sensibility. By thus pointing out these problematic dualisms, Maimon and the neo humming critics left a foothold open for skepticism within the framework of Kant's own philosophy. For now the question arose how two such heterogeneous realms as the intellectual and the sensible could be known to correspond with one another. The problem was no longer how we know that our representations correspond with things in themselves but how we know that a priori concepts apply to a posteriori intuitions. Schelling and Hegel, however, tried to solve this problem by claiming that opposites are absolutely identical. Maimon's concept of an infinite mind as the basis of all opposites was similar to the German idealistic attempt to rescue theism by positing an absolute mind or spirit. Maimon's metaphysical concept of infinite mind was similar to Fichte's Ich and Hegel's Geist. He ignored the results of Kant's criticism in return to pre-Kantian transcendent speculation. What characterizes Fichte's Schelling's and Hegel's speculative idealism in contrast to Kant's critical idealism is the recurrence of metaphysical ideas from the rationalist tradition. Now Maimon was the crucial figure behind this transformation. By reviving metaphysical ideas from within the problematic of the critical philosophy, he gave them a new legitimacy and opened up the possibility for a critical resurrection of metaphysics. Maimon is said to have influenced Hegel's writing on Spinoza. T. Here seems to be a striking similarity between Maimon's discussion of Spinoza in the Lebensgeschichte and Hegel's discussion of Spinoza in the Lectures in the History of Philosophy. Hegel Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel was a German philosopher born in Stuttgart, Württemberg, in present-day southwest Germany. Hegel responded to Kant's philosophy by suggesting that the unsolvable contradictions given by Kant in his antinomies of pure reason applied not only to the four areas Kant gave but in all objects and conceptions, notions and ideas. 
To know this he suggested, makes a vital part in a philosophical theory, given that abstract thought is thus limited. He went on to consider how historical formations give rise to different philosophies and ways of thinking. For Hegel, thought fails when it is only given as an abstraction and is not united with considerations of historical reality. In his major work The Phenomenology of Spirit he went on to trace the formation of self-consciousness through history and the importance of other people in the awakening of self-consciousness. Thus Hegel introduces two important ideas to metaphysics and philosophy, the integral importance of history and of the other person. His work is theological in that it replaces the traditional concept of God with that of an absolute spirit. Spinoza, who changed the anthropomorphic concept of God into that of an abstract, vague, underlying substance, was praised by Hegel whose concept of absolute fulfilled a similar function. Hegel claimed that, you are either a Spinozist or not a philosopher at all, reality results from God's thinking, according to Hegel.